So first of all, it's, um, it's great to be here. Um, please don't ask me any questions about Brexit. Um, it's um, almost humiliating as an Englishman to be standing here uh, in Ireland and, and having to acknowledge the stupidity of what my country has just done. Uh, so I can only apologize. But it is great to be here in Ireland, and um, as some of you may know, um, we're heavily involved in um, the Accenture Innovation Center, which is currently being built out and launching, um, and, and very, very proud and excited by what's happening there. Um, and I was at dinner last night with a, with a range of people from different companies uh, who have significant operations in Ireland, like Airbnb um, and LinkedIn and Twitter, and, and it was interesting hearing their perspective on what's happening in this market and across Europe as well. But what I'm going to do today is talk about, um, quickly talk about some of our thinking about what's happening with design. So just for some context, we have about 800 designers worldwide. I've been running the company with a colleague, a couple of colleagues since 2001 when we set it up. We're in 21 studios, um, and, and, and what we do is design innovation. We hold design at the heart of the company. That's, that's our core. We're not about to start doing other stuff. These are the things we do, design and innovation. So as part of that, one of the things we've been reflecting on a lot over the last year, um, two years, has been the rise of design thinking, which I know is in the title of what we're meant to be talking about today. And there's something that worries me about design thinking, and it worried me a lot when it got onto the cover of Harvard Business Review last year. And what worries me is, and, and we're passionate believers in, in, the, efficient, in the efficacy of, of design thinking, but what worries me is that when something makes it onto the cover of Harvard Business Review, it's in danger of becoming a management fad. And everyone will love it for about three or four years. And then in about three or four years' time, there will be a very academic and learned article in the same publication, basically saying design thinking is pants. And here's the proof. We've measured these companies. We've measured the ones that do design thinking. Actually, it doesn't work, and it's a waste of time. And like all management fads, it will move away. So we wouldn't want that to happen to design, because we do believe passionately in it. And we don't think it's just about design thinking. So don't get me wrong. I'm not here to trash the idea of design thinking. I'm here to say design thinking on its own is not enough. If all that happens is that a bunch of consultants turn up and start thinking, talking about how you need to be customer-centric, about how you need to run workshops, about how you need to co-create with customers, et cetera, et cetera, that actually on its own is not enough. We can talk about that till the cows come home. We can do it, and it's fun. It does work. But on its own, it's not enough. You actually need three things with design. We call it the rule of three. Design thinking, design doing, and design culture. And of that trinity, the last turns out to be the hardest. So design doing is about taking that stuff that you see on the walls, that you're seeing now in many corporations um, becoming very clear and open and, and, and broad-based thinking and collaborating with different stakeholders in order to create the thinking behind the new services that need to emerge. I'll come back to that in a, po in a moment. It's about taking those things and, and actually making them physically manifest. And that turns out to be very difficult. And it's also the reason why what we've seen unbelievably clearly in the last year is the rise of a large number of clients asking us, please, can you actually help us set up a design outfit? Because we need one. So we're working with, with, with a bank in another market. And they've asked us to uh, stand up a team of 30 designers. Now, 30 is a medium-sized studio for us. So this is actually a big challenge. And, and the deal that we've done with them is to transition um, those 30 designers. Initially, they will all be Fjordians. It's what we call people who work in Fjord. They'll initially all be Fjordians, and they will gradually transition over to being full-time in this bank. And that's going to take three years. That's the agreement we had, that it would take that long to make that happen. But this is not the only example. We're hearing many, many clients saying, actually, how do we find these people? And, and it's a challenge, because actually, great designers are in, in relatively rare supply still across the world. So we're seeing this shift, dramatic shift, towards clients saying, how do we do design doing? How do we actually get this stuff out? And an ancillary problem to that one is, um, where do they sit? So, um, and I've had numerous conversations, often with CIOs, who are saying, and CMOs, I don't actually understand where design should sit in the organization. Who owns design? Um, and, and at the moment, we're hearing a multiplicity of different answers to that. Does it sit with the CMO? Does it sit with the CIO? Is it a separate thing? Is it horizontal or vertical? All those sort of 
on the face of it, rather boring, but actually terribly important questions. Um, at the moment, our conclusion is if you set up a separate design unit and you house it in somewhere over here and it isn't attached to the mothership, it isn't going to succeed. Uh, they may make a lot of interesting noise, but they won't actually get anything out the door, and it's getting stuff out the door that really counts. So I mentioned design culture. That's the third of the rule of three. Design culture also turns out to be very difficult, and I was with our, uh, one of our teams, um, uh, at a client premises where they're working four out of five days at the moment, and, and it didn't look like a studio. This is about two months ago, and I said, why, why, why is this environment you're in not look like a studio? So, and we're all familiar with this now, you know, lots of stuff on the walls, lots of post-its everywhere, lots of drawings, lots of stuff to play with, et cetera, et cetera. It was a sterile environment. And our lead in this particular project said to me, the facilities manager here in this building, client building, won't let us put anything on the walls. And I, I thought it was a really, really interesting point, because if you're going to embed a design culture in an organization, you actually need to get the hearts and minds of the back office people as well. So HR needs to get their head around how do we incentivize and motivate actually quite a diverse set of skills in order to come in and work in this bank, telco, utility company, whatever it may be. And, and it's not just HR. Legal need to get their head around a different set of way of doing things. Facilities, as I just mentioned, need to do the same. Finance, often. So lots of things change if you're going to actually generate a design culture, and it's not nearly as simple as it sounds. But these are definitely the challenges that we're seeing beginning to emerge. So why are those challenges emerging, particularly now? Our belief is that we're now entering the third era of digital. The first era was desktop web. The second was mobile, still in the middle of that, hasn't gone away at all, despite what I'm about to say. The third era is living services. These living services are the things we will be working on over the next five to 10 years. And they represent a dramatic shift from where we had been before, because what is happening is complexity is being layered up. Eight, nine years ago, most designers that I was working with, most design, digital designers in the world, we're thinking about a user who would be using a screen about this big and a keyboard and a mouse as their interaction paradigm. Now they're thinking about screens of every size down to this size, and sometimes they're thinking about no screen at all, Amazon Echo, connected cars, et cetera, et cetera. They're thinking about interaction paradigms which are no longer just about keyboard and mouse, but touch, swipe, voice, gesture, location. Location for Uber, for example, is an interaction paradigm all on its own and for, and for other companies to come. So this is layering up a heap of complexity. At the same time, largely because of price, we're seeing sensors, connectivity, the cloud, et cetera, et cetera, now getting to a price point where they're becoming ubiquitous. And as they become ubiquitous, so what we're seeing is the digitization of absolutely everything. So uh, my favorite example at the moment is still hotel doors. So hotel doors are really stupid objects. But Hilton and Starwood are making them semi-dumb by putting sensors in them. When they put sensors in them, you can do lots of things with a hotel door which has a sensor in it. I, I won't go there because I haven't got time in 10 minutes. What I will say, though, is I think the most important thing is that for travelers all over the world, hundreds of thousands of people over the next two to three years, they will suddenly discover that a hotel door can be a little bit smarter than it was before. And they will be buying cars which are a lot smarter than they were before, and fridges, and coffee machines, and many, many, many other things. So this is the digitization of everything, and it's happening very fast. And what that enables is for us to be able to sequence new services which change in real time around the customer. That is significantly different from the relatively flat, static experiences we have even through apps. I could tell you a little story. About four weeks ago in London, Friday night, going for a beer with my best mates from school, stepping out of the office at six o'clock, I realized I didn't know the name. I knew the name of the pub, I didn't know where it was. So I looked it up on the line, on, online, Google Maps, I thought, Found out where it was, didn't know how to walk there, so I did send to phone. We've all done it, so you send the map to the phone. Open it up with Google Maps, turn on Spotify, step out of the office, start to walk towards this pub, 17 minutes away, according to the map, as I stepped out of the office. Three meters down the road, my phone buzzed, so I opened it again and had a look. It was an alert from Google. It said, the pub will still be closed at the time you get there. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> it, is, it is magic. It is, it's just extraordinary. And, and what is significant about this, it is easy to begin to figure out, as you're probably doing now, how did Google do that, is they put together an algorithm which detected my context, knew several things about me, and then gave me something useful. Now, they could have gone further. What they could have done, and I think they will do, is they could have said, we know the two friends you're meeting because it's in your calendar. 
Shall we alert them as well? And by the way, there's another pub which does better beer three minutes away. <laughs> Would you like to go there? <clears throat> so this is what we call living services. And it will be an accumulation of many, many, many micro moments like that across the day, which fundamentally change our lives. And that is what is going to happen next. And I think the question that, if you begin to think about that Google example, the question is, how did they design that? Actually, how did they think that up? Where did that come from? And as designers, the challenge I think we have to face next, design thinking, design doing, and design culture, is to figure out what is the process by which we will begin to design these living services which change in real time around us? Because that is not an easy thing to do. And actually, we've, we've started that process. Um, we believe that it will involve, and this is just a hypothesis at the moment, four key components. Um, a playbook, which says what happens. Um, a, um, a purpose, which is what is it you're trying to make happen here. Um, a micro moment, or a bundle of micro moments, which are defined very clearly, and an atomized profile of the customer. And that you need to put these things together in order to create this sequence of living services, which will be incredibly individualized around all users. Uh, and we, this, this challenge, and I'm, I'm just talking about this the first time I've actually talked about this publicly, but we're, we've, we've developed quite a significant body of thinking around actually how do we design living services. If you want to take a look at our website, we've got a lot of thinking on there about what living services are and what they're going to be and why they're happening now. Now we need to push beyond that and say, so actually how do we build these? Um, and expect to hear a lot more of that um, over the next few years, because that is where design thinking needs to go. Thank you very much for your time. Want to be in the audience next time? Click here for tickets to InspireFest 2017.